This morning we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5. If you would turn there with me, we'll be looking at the first five verses of chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Don't turn to John, the Gospel of John, but 1 John, which is way towards the end, way towards the back of your Bible. Um, So 1 John chapter 5. Let me read these words with you. It says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. But by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's pray together. Father, we come to your word this morning seeking to know what it has for us, knowing that this is your word breathed out for us, that we might apply it to our lives, that we might be more like our Savior. Lord, help us to know the truths that are here. Lord, remove the distractions of life from our minds so that we can focus. And Lord, let your Spirit move in our hearts. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you ever wonder why we sing some of the songs that we sing, well, this passage, as I was studying it this week, it's obvious that there's a song that goes right along with it, the song that we sang, Faith is the Victory, uh, comes right from verse 4. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. That's why we sang that song. It's a song that we haven't sang since I've been here. Um, So it's a, it's, it's, sometimes it's just as simple as that. Why do, why did you pick that song, Pastor Tim? Well, it was because it came right out of that passage, and it relates right with what we are uh, going to be talking about that week. So uh, this week, that, that song uh, was an obvious choice, in case you were wondering, uh, why that song? Um, but as we come into 1 John, we've been reading uh, through, through the New Testament. We're, we're reading uh, these letters of John this week, uh, 1 John, 2 and 3 John. Um, and these are passages, uh, all of this section that we've been focusing on the last couple of weeks are probably less less known to us or maybe less sermons are preached from them. Uh, and then I would say First John and especially Second and Third John are no different. But, but John, the disciple, the apostle, is the, uh, the author of all of these letters. Uh, you know him mostly from uh, the Gospel of John, but he also wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, so that's another uh, uh, letter that is ascribed to John the apostle. And when we come to uh, John's writings, what is interesting is when you take Greek, uh, if you ever decide to do that, John is where you're going to start in because John has the simplest words. When you, when you go and you start learning Greek, John uses a very simple uh, vocabulary. Uh, but that is not to be mistaken for John having simple thoughts. In fact, when you come across John and you study the Gospel of John, and even these letters that we've been reading through, and if you've ever read the book of Revelation, you'll know right away that John is very complex in his theology. Uh, and so he uses a lot of simple words, but the thoughts, the, the concepts are very complex. Um, I remember when I was in seminary, we had a professor there, uh, uh, James Greer, Dr. Greer, uh, some of you may know him. He's been in, he was part of the GRBC for many years. He's passed away now uh, just a few years ago. But uh, when you would hear Dr. Greer speak, you would have to take a dictionary with you because the words that he used were like words you never heard. And you'd be like, what is this guy talking about? Communicating complex ideas with complex terminology uh, to be very precise in what he was saying. Uh, so sometimes complex, uh, big words are necessary to convey uh, a message, and it, they're done so with someone who is uh, 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 greatly uh, a great intellect in that area. Sometimes you use big words, though, to hide our ignorance. I've heard sometimes when you, 
you talk and you throw out a big word every now and then to make it sound like you know what you're talking about, but you really just don't. Uh, and sometimes you use that word incorrectly and people are just like, what are you talking about? So sometimes you see that. It's just a, a, a method of way to hide our ignorance. Um, but I, I learned uh, in college, and then it was reinforced in seminary, that the most important thing isn't the size of our words, the big, how wonderful our vocabulary it is, but are we communicating what needs to be communicated? Uh, having the other person understand us is far more important than using a big word. Uh, what word gets the, the message across? Because if you're talking and no one's understanding it, then you failed. Communication is actually having the other person understand what you're talking about. And so I believe John uses a lot of simple terms because he is talking about complex things and he wants to give us the best chance at understanding it. Uh, if you were to use larger vocabulary, we would have a real uh, issue here. But the, 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 the message or the, the purpose of 1 John is very similar to what we see in 2 and 3 John. But the, the, John has a very precise reason for writing this letter, and we find it at the end of the letter in verse 13. So if you look at 1 John 5, 13, he says this, I write these things to you, everything that he has said previously, and he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So I write these things to you who are believers. And then he says, that, or in order that, you may know that you have eternal life. The reason that John is writing this letter is so that you will know that you have eternal life. He's talking about assurance here. Uh, how, can, how do we know for certain that we, uh, that we have eternal life, that we do belong to Christ? Right? It's that's a pretty important thing, I think, we would all agree, that having that assurance is something that we would uh, we long to have. In fact, this is something that uh, uh, many Christians struggle with. How can I be sure? Am I, am I, am I really saved? Am I really, do I really belong to Christ? Uh, even some well-known Christians through the years, uh, folks, that, the, those guys who you read about in the church history, some of those guys struggled with that especially at the end of life, when they got close to their time of dying, they would they were think, am I, am I sure? Uh, one pastor, I, I remember hearing a sermon a few years ago that a pastor said something that I, I, I agree with, and he's just the, he said it in a way that I hadn't heard anyone express it before, and he basically said, if that's something you're struggling with, it's probably because you are a believer. And he said, think about it this way. What unbeliever do you know that struggles with that question? Do you know any unbelievers walking down the street thinking, am I saved? Do I really belong? Do I belong to God? I'm struggling with that. It's only the believer who struggles with that question. Now, we're going to get into some things that John says here in the letter that I think are, are, are helpful beyond that. But understand that, 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 that asking that question is a something that comes naturally to us. Even as believers, we struggle with that. One thing that's uh, also, that as we go through this, as we go through this letter, understand this, that any type of works-based religion can never answer that question. The, the, there's the works-based that says, I, I have done this, therefore I know that I am right with God. Because there, you're always going to ask the question, have I done enough? Is that an, have I lived a good enough life? Have I measured up to God's standard? Whatever the bar is, have I done enough? So any works-based religion, you're always going to struggle with, have I done enough? Well, Christianity, the Bible tells us that none of us have done enough and none of us ever could do enough. That we have all fall short of that bar of enough because the bar is perfection. The bar is perfect sinlessness. And scripture tells us that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we can never do enough in our own efforts to measure up to God's standard of perfection. 
So we all fall short, which tells us then that we need to be saved, that we can't do it ourselves. Somebody, somebody is going to have to do it for us, which is what Christ did for us. Christ came and took the punishment for our sins that we could be saved, that we could have eternal life with the Lord. And Scripture tells us it's not then what we do, but it's simply by believing in what Christ has already done for us, having faith in that. And through Christ, we are born again to new life and given eternal life in his name. So that goes back to our question then. What, John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. How then do we know? John gives us three tests in this letter that we might know that we have eternal life. He gives us three tests, and these three tests are found throughout the letter. The, the entire book is written with these three tests as the central focus. And he mentions them multiple times. He doesn't just say, here's test one and go through it, here's test two and go through it. He mentions them multiple times. He'll, he'll go through the first test and the second test and the third test, and he'll come back to them again, and he'll put them in a different order. And he does it about three different times for each of these. Uh, but he gives us three tests, and he keeps coming back to them. And in our short passage that I just read, this, uh, these five verses, he's, he mentions all three of them together. That's why I chose this section to start with. Uh, in these five verses, he kind of summarizes them all together succinctly. And in 1 John 5, 1, where we began, he begins speaking about belief. Notice that. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. We see this right at the very beginning of the passage. Everyone who believes, and he ends the section in verse 5 with the same focus on belief again. Uh, in verse 5, he says, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So he starts and ends this, this uh, passage with belief, believing. Uh, but notice what he says, that we have to believe. He, he says a couple specific things here. He starts off by saying, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Jesus is the Christ. That word Christ here is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah. Uh, and so when we think of Jesus, when we think about who Jesus is, we have to first understand that he is the Messiah, the Christ. Uh, the word means the anointed one, the one who was promised from the Old Testament. See, the Jewish people were waiting for this promised Messiah, this promised anointed one. He was the one who would sit on the throne of Israel forever. And so we first have to understand that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament that was promised to David that he would have a son who would sit on his throne forever. Jesus is the Messiah. But also when we come down even further into verse 5 there, notice it doesn't say the believes that Jesus is the Christ here. He says, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? See, yes, Jesus was the Messiah, but he was even more than that. He was the Son of God himself. Yes, he was the Son of David who would sit on the, in the, on the throne forever, but he was greater than David. He was the Son of God. This verse here is pointing to the fact that Jesus was divine. He wasn't just a man. He was the God-man, the Son of God. And so throughout history, false teachers have, uh, have, have come and gone, and they've taught other things about who Christ is. Most false teaching, you can identify it right away, because when you ask who Jesus is, they don't understand who Jesus is. They will say something else. He was, uh, they'll say something like, well, he was a good man, which is true, but he's more than that. Or he was a good teacher. Well, again, truth, but there's much more to Jesus than he was just a good teacher. Or he was a prophet sent by God. 
but they will fall short of saying that he was God in the flesh, or they will fall short of saying that he was the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. The church has always rejected those who have spoken uh, those things about Christ, that have rejected his divinity and have re rejected the fact that he was the promised Messiah. And it's because of passages like this that Christians have said, if you don't believe this about Jesus, then you're not one of us. You can't call yourself Christian without holding to the divinity of Christ and the Messiahship of Christ. This is the plain teaching of Scripture. So, John gives us this first test here, and he says, you must believe rightly about Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Messiah, and that he is the Son of God. Right belief. John has mentioned this earlier in the letter. If you look back with me at chapter 2, uh, in verses 18 to 27, he speaks of right belief there. He says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are all that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all have knowledge, this knowing, this what you believe. I wrote to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Notice this, the false teachers are the ones who deny this. Deny that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Notice that, the Father and the Son. We're right back to uh, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that, that he made, us, made to us eternal life. Uh, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing, the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you ha have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you abide in him. And so we have this, uh, uh, this idea of the knowledge and the knowing the truth that we find in verse 21 there. The liars deny that Jesus is the Christ. Verse 22, they, uh, the false teachers deny the Father and the Son. Verses 22 and 23. And so we see this uh, coming up previously in the letter. We also see it in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 there. It says, Beloved, I do not believe ever, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world, but this you, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Notice that. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus the Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. And so again, it's about this right belief on who Jesus is. This reminds us that, uh, of John's gospel, where John begins the gospel uh, by speaking of the Word. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not, was not anything made that was made, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So this is how John begins his gospel, the first five verses there in John chapter 1. But then when we get to read a few more verses down, when he talks about the Word, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have to believe the right thing about Jesus. He was the Christ. He was the Son of God. John's letters 
are clear about this. Notice right at the very beginning of this letter of 1 John, notice what he says there, starting the very, very beginning. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we, have, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Notice what he says here. That which we have heard and we have seen and we have touched has been made manifest to us. We're writing these things to you so that you may know about him. This is speaking of Christ, the one who came as a man. He was manifest. He appeared to them. The one who was the Christ and the Son of God, and now that's who they proclaim. This is who the apostles gave their lives to, uh, to proclaim the good news about. Christ has come, God in the flesh. And so John tells us the first thing that we must do to know that we have eternal life is believe. What does it mean, though, to believe? I think this is a question we need to ask. What does it mean to believe? It has to be more than just knowing that the facts are true. Because Scripture tells us that even the demons believe the facts but yet they're not saved. James 2.19 tells us, you do well, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. See, the demons had a right understanding of who God is. They believed the facts, and they shuddered. Mark chapter 1, verse 24 tells us this. Jesus says he was... Uh, uh, dealing with a, a man with a demon. It says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Actually, he had multiple demons in this passage. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? This is the demon speaking to Jesus. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demons understood who Jesus was, the Holy One of God. Even more clearly, in Matthew 8, verses, verse 29, it says, And behold, they cried out. This is, again, the demons crying out to Jesus. What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? The demons knew the facts. That wasn't a question. But what does it mean then to believe? The word's often translated faith. Uh, it depend, even in our passage here today, in verse 4, we see this word translated faith. It depends on if you're reading it in the noun form or the Greek form, to, that you have faith or that it is faith. Uh, the, the noun versus the Greek. The, the verb. The verb is often translated as believe, and the noun is often translated as faith in our English Bible. So what we find here in verse 4 then for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It could also say our belief, and it would be a perfectly good translation. Our belief. Or we could go back up to verse 1, where it says everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. We could also translate that everyone who has faith that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. It would be a perfectly fine translation. We have to understand here, it's from the same word, though. One is the noun and one is a, uh, a verb. So, but what does it mean, then, if, if it's not just an acknowledgement of the facts, what does it mean to believe? It's a commitment to those facts. It's, it's knowing the facts and saying, this changes my life. We have to orient our life around the facts. This is why we often use the word trust here. Uh, we put our trust in those things, our faith. Uh, 
we, we know that they are true and we, we, we see that we believe them by how we live our lives then as we go out from there. We trust in them. Our, our world is oriented around it. So, so what we see here then is right belief, placing our trust, placing our faith in Jesus is the first test. This is why it says faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Our belief. But John goes on there to a second test. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And then he goes on and says, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. So the second test here then is the test of love. Uh, do we love the Father? And beyond that, do we love fellow believers? Uh, everyone who has been born of the Father, it says here. Whoever has been born of him. We see this idea of love being an essential element of our salvation when we look at other places in 1 John. For instance, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. There it says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now when it talks about brother here, it's talking about our, our fellow believers. It's not talking about the, the one that we share bloodlines with. It's talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Those who say that they love God, who belong to God, and then hate their fellow believer, there's, it doesn't add up. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. 1 John chapter 3, uh, verses 11 through 18. John speaks of it here as well. He says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So our love for God and our love for others here is the second test. Chapter 4, we see it again in verse 16. We read these words. Uh, so we have come to know and to believe the, the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, uh, by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is all, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For he, fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Notice that. It's our love for God and for our fellow believers that is part of our assurance that we truly belong to the Lord. Belief in our right love. John's gospel, John also mentions this. Uh, and Jesus speaking there in John 13 says this. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. 
Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Our love for God and our love for believers, it's God who is our Father. But believers, as Cal mentioned in his prayer earlier, our fellow believers are our family. We have the same Father. And so we must love our brothers and sisters in Christ that belong to our family. So this is the second test. We'll come back to these in just a moment, but this is the second test, our love for God and for our fellow believers. And the last one is obedience. So we have right belief, love, and obedience. Notice verses 2 and 3. It says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Third test, obedience to God and his commandments. See, we just talked about loving God and loving others, but what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to love God and love others? See, see love in the Bible isn't just about a feeling. It's not just about our emotions, how we feel about someone or something. But it's about how we, what, it does include our feelings, so don't get me wrong. Our feelings are a part of it. We can't just dismiss our feelings and our emotions. We, those things must also be in, in right order. But our love is primarily shown in our actions. If we say we, oh, we love the Lord, then it would make sense then that we would follow the Lord. See, our love is shown in action. Uh, again, John says this elsewhere in this letter, in J chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, he says, uh, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And in 1 John chapter 2, at the end of the chapter, starting in verse 28, it says this, And now little children abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Notice that, the practicing of righteousness, our actions. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does uh, not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we, we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, and he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he, and he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Notice that. It's the one who practices righteousness, it tells us there in verse 29. This is practicing what is right, doing what is right. It's our actions. But the one who, so the one who practices righteousness there, it says, uh, says that we are righteous and we belong to the one who is righteous. But notice that it also says uh, that the one who continues in verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And so our obedience, our, our actions, our way of life shows who we belong to. The one who practices righteousness belongs to the one who is righteous. The one who continues sinning, 
belongs to the devil. So our obedience is a, a test of who do we belong to? Who do we love? So if we truly love God, then our lives will not be lived in rebellion, in rejection of what God has said, but they'll be lived in, uh, 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 in alignment with those things. Notice what it says there, too, also in, in verse, uh, uh, verse 3 there. It says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. This is how we put into action our love for God. We keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. When you love the Lord, his commands aren't burdensome. There's something that we love to do. We want to please our, God, our Father. The commandments aren't burdensome as in, well, I'm just going to do this because I have to do it. I don't want to do it, but I'll do it just because this is what I have to do. That's what a legalist says. The one who does not know God as Father, but sees God as a taskmaster or a slave driver. They do it, but it's burdensome to them. There's no love there. But the one who loves the Lord obeys his commandments and it's not a burden. It's a joy. Think about this in your own personal relationships with, with people. When you say that you love your parents, does that mean that you will never do anything that they have for you? They, when they ask you to do something, uh, you're not going to do it? What, what kind of love would that indicate? Or when you say that you love your spouse, that you're not going to... Uh, 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 actually put anything into practice. It's just about a feeling or an emotion, but as far as actually uh, how you relate to the other person, you just ignore them or you, uh, you are always going against their wishes and desires. Uh, does that make sense? So when we say that we love God, there ought to be a response to God's will in our lives that we want to do what he desires because we love him. And how do we show our love for one another? Again, it's by our actions. If I say I love you, but I ignore you, or I don't care about the things going on in your life, and I take no involvement, what kind of love is that? It's no love at all. So we, we show our love in our actions, in our obedience. I want to show you something here in this passage that you probably aren't quick to pick up on. There's three tests. Right belief, love for God and our fellow believers, and obedience to God's commands. Not begrudgingly, but out of love. But John links all of these. There's a reason that he says these things are the tests that will Help us to know that we truly have eternal life. He links all of these things. In verse 1, he says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Uh, we also see it in verse 4. Again, it says, Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And so uh, John is using this idea of being uh, born again or born of God to link this obedience and this love and this uh, 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 right belief together. Uh, it becomes even clearer in a, if we look at a more literal translation of the Greek words. So let me pull up a translation that translates this as literally as possible while still being English. Uh, this is from what is known as the literal standard version. Um, this is actually a new translation. It's come out just recently. But what it tries to do here is keep consistently, translates those words the same. Notice how, remember we talked about belief and faith. It tries to keep these kind of words the same throughout but it also tries to translate verb forms like present and past and future tenses, it tries to make those uh, very consistent with the Greek as well. 
But notice how what it says here in verse 1, is in the literal version here. It says, everyone who is believing, that, be, cur, that believes currently, is believing that Jesus is the Christ, has been begotten of God. This idea of being begotten, born of God. And everyone who is loving him who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. Now notice it's a little bit wooden there, but notice this consistency in this idea of being begotten. The one who is believing, the one who believes correctly, has been begotten. Present tense believing, past tense begotten. What he is saying here is, this is evidence that you have been born again, begotten of God. And everyone who is loving him who begot, our, tra- our most English translations here call it love the Father, because that's what the one who begets is, is the Father. But that's not the Greek. It just simply means the one who begot. Some translations actually say fathered, the one who fathered us. Uh, but it's the one who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. So we have been begotten, and we love others who have been begotten. And we love the one who begot us. We have been born again. This this idea here, then, is it's the being born again that links all of this together. Born again leads to right belief. Born again leads to right loves. Born again leads to obedience. Notice that. If we have been born again, we believe, every, and we also love the one who begot us, and we love the ones who are begotten of him. And in verse 4, as we continue on in this literal translation, it says, because everyone who is begotten of God, born of God, overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcame the world, our faith. John is linking all of these by our new birth. Back in chapter 2, we see it there. Chapter 2, verse 29. It says now, or I'll start in verse 28. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears we have made confidence, may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Chapter 3, 9 and 10. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness has not been born of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. The one who has been born of God does not make a practice of sinning. It's evident who you are born of, if you are a child of God or if you are a child of the devil by how you live your life. 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. See, if we belong to God who is love, we are, we, are a, we are a descendant of that God. And those characteristics ought to be part of us. This idea of being born again or born of God is something that we see in John's Gospel as well. There in chap, John chapter 3, we see Nicodemus come to Jesus and say, what must, I do to be, uh, what must I do to have eternal life? Which is interesting because that's what John is addressing here in 1 John, that we may know that we have eternal life. And there in John chapter 3, we read this. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. We know that you are a teacher comes from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
So here it's called being born again. In 1 John here, we're reading that it's born of God. In other places in Scripture, some of Paul's writings, he talks about being a new creation in Christ. But the idea here is it's the new birth that makes, makes us, it changes us. There is a new person. When we come into a right relationship with the Lord, there's a work of the Spirit in our lives that changes who we are. It's a new birth, born again, a new creation. And it's this new birth that gives, makes this right belief, this love for God and others, and this obedience a part of who we are. So when John says that these are the tests that we may know, that we have eternal life, we could also say these are the tests that we may know that we have been born again. Because that is the ultimate test. Have you been born again? That's the assurance that our lives have been changed by the gospel. That we have heard the truth. That we've believed it. Placed our faith, our trust in it. It's changed our lives. That our loves have been reoriented, that we love the Lord and we love our fellow believers who are our family now, our brothers and sisters. And that we obey God, not because we have to, but because we want to. It's our joy to serve the Lord. This morning I ask you, have your lives been changed by the gospel? Do you believe? Do you love? Do you obey? That's our assurance. And this morning, if you haven't, would you place your trust in Christ this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you that we can have assurance to know that we belong to you. To know that your spirit has worked in our hearts to change us. Lord, we're thankful that it is done through your power and not ours. So we know that we have no power to, to make these changes. Lord, we're, we're thankful for your word that helps us to be sure. We're thankful for a gospel that is based on grace and not merit. Lord, your word tells us that we have all fallen short. But if we place our trust in Jesus Christ, that we can be saved. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us here this morning that that would be true in our lives, that we would trust Christ. And Lord, that we would go out into the world as witnesses, proclaiming the goodness and the miracle of the gospel. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.